On this episode, my father-in-law comes on to hawk his book. This is Gary Vay, Nerd Chuck, and this is episode 153 of the Ask Gary V Show. As you can see, in a rare situation. By the way, we're doing a double header today. We're doing a double header today, Peter. I'll introduce Peter in a second. We're doing a double header today, so that's the first time we've ever done that. So I like the fact that D-Rock and Stefan are both gonna actually have to work India. That's good for a change, right? And we'll be editing it up and I'm excited. Are you guys, I guess we can release them very similar at the same time. I'm, I'm excited about that. But Peter, uh, why don't you tell the Vayner Nation uh, who you are? Hello everybody. This is <laughs> Peter Klein. And yes, I really am Gary Vaynerchuk's father-in-law. It's true. Uh, in this episode, I'm glad to say we're gonna reverse the roles a bit and uh, we're going to reverse Gary into moving from Mr. Answer Man to Mr. Question Man. Okay. Uh, and, but before Do that, you know this, India? No. Okay, good. Here we go. We've got to be flexible in our business. Yep. And um, <laughs> before we ask Gary to maybe ask a couple questions of why I'm really here sitting in on this version, I want to ask uh, Gary a, uh, maybe a bit of an introspective question building yes, on a question asked by... Um, Mark um, Cuban, okay. in episode 151 and a half, yeah, so I might be accurate or not, 150 and a half. when he wanted to know, and he, I think he basically asked Gary, Gary, when you interview yes. talent, yes. you know, what are a few of the key questions yes. you ask in almost every interview? Yes. So my question to you, Gary, uh, is really three parts, uh, the first two pretty fast, but uh, in your history, yes. from a kid on, yes. through today, yes. Was there ever an individual, guy or gal, yes. who you think intensely disliked you? I did, uh, yes or no? That knew me? Yes, sir. And I would use the word almost hate, but I'd go short of that. Intensely, or you think disliked you? That knew me for more than a second or just came but across me? Don't try Well, to, the answer is a ton of people. Uh, okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, second part of it is yeah. um, give me the name of one of them. Just first I've, name alone. Just o, first name. Oded. Oday? Oded. Oded? O D E D. Oded. Oded. Uh, Oded. Oded. Gary's not here. Okay. What do you dislike with Gary? Oh, Peter, here's the thing. In, so we're in second grade, and Gary's very popular, and everybody likes him, and that bothers me, so I'm not going to invite him to his birthday party. And to my birthday party, because uh, I'm Oded, uh, because uh, I'm jealous of his enormous charisma. Okay. Well, my follow up to that was basically going to be that you scored fine on that question on passion and transparency. Yes. I'm not quite sure on the transparency side. Well, I think that's the truth. But if it's that's the truth, then introspective wise, that's fine. Peter, hold on. I, I, I'm going to jump in here. Guys, I adore my father in law. Let me tell you a fun fact. Peter, why don't you, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play a little bit here as host. Hey, here's a little fun fact. This is gonna blow a lot of people's minds away. What, you know, you were a, a tremendously uh, successful marketer and you once were involved in the naming rights of a football stadium when you were an executive, true? True. Why don't you tell the Vayner Nation what stadium that was? Gillette Stadium, New England Patriots. Uh, a couple of us went there in uh, very early 01. Can you believe this? Sorry. So we still made the I still made the cut to get on the Ask uh, Gary V show, <laughs> and uh, the headline was we didn't even know there was a stadium being built at the time. Um, doing a, working on a turnaround at the Gillette Company, and maybe a year into the turnaround, uh, the Kraft family approached us. Uh, actually, a software company, CMGI, I think may have gone from Bailed. 100 180 dollars a share down to five or ten dollars. <laughs> they had bought the rights to the new stadium. And before the stadium opened, uh, they wanted out. So uh, to cut, make a long story short, uh, we were able to 
get the naming rights to uh, Gillette Stadium. So Vayner Nation, you, you probably will find this super fascinating. Peter, uh, you know, I, uh, when I met Peter's lovely daughter, Lizzie, uh, I was very much in the wine business. Peter was actively the top, one of the top executives at Gillette. Uh, Peter, didn't you guys, like, didn't the deal of selling Gillette fall through on the night of our wedding? Um, Isn't there some and, funny story uh, like that? That's right. It, it, it originally... It, <laughs> Is that why you missed the whole domain. wedding? Was that? No, that was public domain. Okay, but good. No, they, no, it was, uh, they decided <laughs> God, sorry, that, uh, to decide to walk for yeah. a few reasons and then they revisited it about four or six weeks later. And that, was must, that, that, was one of the, that was the best day of your life, right? When you knew that your daughter was marrying such a top class human being. You, that must have been a big night for you. Well, that was a big night, but the uh, bigger night was after uh, when we for, finally got to know you, uh, uh, before the big night. Uh, Which so, was when? Uh, when, you know, when? Just uh, without uh, giving too much away here, I kind of knew uh, uh, Gary was a wine expert when on the very first time we ever met was at a dinner here in Manhattan, and um, I came in with a, a, bra a bottle in the wine in a brown paper bag, and <laughs> halfway through the meal, when uh, Mr. My father wine expert, uh, you know, basically told me he knew every wine in the world, <laughs> I said, well, you know, tell me who made this one, and I pulled out a, a bottle that on the front label said Major League Baseball, uh, you know, special edition kind of thing, and before, without even turning around the bottle, uh, Gary uh, nailed who made it and where, where it was made. Thanks, and then finally, the second meeting uh, to, uh, was uh, when I drove up to my home uh, <laughs> to have dinner. Yes. And uh, knew Gary was going to be there for dinner with my daughter. And as I drive up to the house, I'm driving up and I see the identical car I'm driving. Uh, color, <laughs> type, So weird. And I was convinced when I walked inside that Gary rented that car. <laughs> I try to make a, a, a good impression. Anybody, it was his actual car. Listen. But I, even, thanks for the time yeah. today. As you can imagine, what, a, what an unbelievable, you know, when you get to marry someone, you're marrying their family as well, and, and, and I, I couldn't have gotten luckier with Lizzie and her family, Peter being at the forefront of that. Obviously, as my career took a different change and got into this corporate marketing world, this is literally, you know, you, you gotta look it up. I mean, the guy's got a book. I mean, I don't know if it's selling as many copies as the books that I tend to sell, Peter. You know, I tend to be a little bit competitive with this stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah I didn't notice, but... <laughs> What's kind of interesting, this is a book that uh, three of us wrote. Uh, it came out in June from McGraw Hill. And um, we uh, did it for a variety of reasons. I'll just briefly tell you what it's about. Um, but no, we didn't sell 60 or 70,000 pre sale. Although it came out in mid June, and we were told that it's in its second printing, uh, kicked in in early September. Nice job. Now, we don't know if they printed nine copies <laughs> in the first round or what, how many copies, but so be it. It's in its second round. Listen, I think. Uh... So, Indy, you have questions. Peter, you don't have questions, do you? What are you doing here? I, by, the way, this is my, like, by the way, this is what's so amazing about you and I. Like, you, look at, Peter, you literally laid out what you were going to say. This is where we differ quite a, a bit. This is a difference. This is a difference between, between the two of us. The discipline of the old, uh, or I'll call it the older generation. Classic, use, uh, who, use classic, uh, who, use classic. Uh, protects himself and prepares uh, in advance versus the 118% uh, left brain driven uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, younger generation. Peter, I'm pretty old compared yeah. to the people that are watching, just so you know. That's uh, probably true. Yeah, look at, like, look at these youngsters. True. How old are you, Stefan? I'm looking around for Stefan's 24. India? 25. India's 25. D-Rock? 24. Look well, at this. And uh, not too distant future, you might move out of the uh, millennial definition. I'm not in it right now. That's right. It okay. sucks. Anyway, are you uh, asking, did you literally bring questions or can no, we get into no. the, we can get into the show? No, we can get we'll into We'll talk a little show. more about the book because yeah. I'm here to make sure the Vayner Nation buys 58 million copies of it. Just but India, India, uh, let's get into the show. You ready, PK? Sorry, we're both gonna ready. answer. We're both gonna answer here. Good. All right. Ready. I mean, we'll play around. Let's see what happens here. I mean, we wasted. We spent a billion minutes. What's that? Oh, you did. India is very. You know, she's sharp. She's a creator. Left brain, one eighteen percent. All right, go ahead. Kyle asks, as someone who's about to turn thirty myself, what was the most important thing you did in your thirties to change your future? PK, why don't you take that? He's about to turn thirty. That's a great question. And the answer is, I took a deep breath, stepped back, and I said to myself, where did I kind of want to be in the next 10 to 20 years from then? I actually was working at Gillette, and I worked there twice, and this was 72 to 78. And I took a step back, and I said, um, you know, I wanted to be in a position between the ages of 32 to 35 
where I could make a decision to kind of stay corporate America and on a fast track and doing all those things, etc., uh, or shift gears and go into a small startup or smaller business environment. Had a couple of my own patents, and so a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit, uh, but wasn't in a position where I really had those choices. Wasn't getting uh, inundated by smaller startups or new ventures. And so I took us, I said, you know what? And I love Gillette, they were doing great, and they would buy me and everything that counted. Uh, and I said, you know, I've got to get into the New York area uh, where I'll, and I made a decision to move into New York with a large company who I communicated with and said, hey, for three to five years, I'm going to beat the bushes and see if I want to stay or go into small business. And so that's kind of when I stepped back, I said, and, uh, and the rest that's of the cool. history. So Peter was there because I married Lizzie when I was 28, turned 29 on our wedding night. Um, and so he saw this, which a lot of you have heard before, which is right at 30, I kind of freaked out a little bit and started really putting the uh, pedal to the metal, started Wine Library TV right after it. And as much as I worked and as intensely as I worked in my late 20s, 30 started the process of this insanity that I'm executing against now. So I just, I just want to buy the Jets and I didn't think I was going fast enough. And so uh, I also took a step back and said, where am I going to be in 10 or 20 years? Let me make sure my behavior maps it. So I think as you're in your 30s, I think it's really smart to think about your 40s and 50s. So what Gary does on intuition and gut and heart and passion, um, I kind of did in my, over my career, maybe in a little more of a discipline, a little more balanced left brain, right brain way. And it was a driver of why we decided to write the book, Thing to Win, was to try to bring some very simple concepts and how-tos in the world of strategy and execution to folks who are working in small, medium, large companies, public or private, even in the uh, not-for-profit sector, where they can take a step back and say, hey, look, here are a few principles, a few how-tos to get folks aligned, fact-based, yep. not myth based um, and get aligned on key issues, key opportunities, and how do we execute. Uh, Yogi Berra, who I was a big fan of, and yes, I do have a signed picture from Don Larson and Yogi Berra. Because uh, all of you were curious. Who, curious of that, <laughs> who said, a good batter will always beat a good pitcher, and vice versa. <laughs> and he, well, he is the best. I'm a believer <laughs> in good strategy always drives good execution and vice versa. Yep. And that's kind of what this book is about, in a more disciplined way, to kind of those how-tos to uh, let some power strategic thinking work for, for Tremendous right hook, Peter. Let's go, India. Ryan asks, how do you deal with drama in the workplace? And how do you avoid having more drama? PK, drama in the workplace. How much were you, as an executive in corporate America, into HR-like stuff, or did you kind of let the pros handle that? I, uh, uh, I love that area. I was into it. I, was, I, I, I was, believe that, by the way. I, I know this guy. I was fairly uh, as Mr. Anal Retentive. So, <laughs> Me too. Uh, I kind of got my fingers uh, dirty. I knew when to step in. And in the anal retentiveness? <laughs> yeah, but at the, end, at the end of the day, jargon aside, um, and I'm a believer, with whom you go is more important than where you go. Uh, I got heavily vested on the HR side because it didn't make any difference what kind of uh, uh, idea you might have, startup or big company, big brand, small brands, whatever. N whatever you're working on, combined with no matter how much capital you may have, working capital for startup business or whatever, at the end of the day, if you didn't have the right people and the right team in place, you're dead. Game over. And so I believe I, that I, so I much. I don't think there's. I don't think there's any Lakers. There's Kobe and Shaq era, and then there's not. And then you know. And then like yeah. Stefan, who's like a Lakers fan, he then becomes a Golden State Warriors fan because he's just bandwagon. But most people, you know. And so I, you know, we know. I've talked plenty about HR. I want to get this thing moving. I want some speed, India. Let's go to the next one. James asks, banks are old, stiff, and have largely the same messaging: safety. Is their sheer size saving them from disruption? for now. Yeah, I'll jump in on this one because I'm spending a lot of time with Silicon Valley that's really 
I mean, what's going on in Silicon Valley now with startups that are looking to attack banks, and if you look at what's going on in general with like Venmo and, and so many other things that we're living through, yeah, I mean, I think banks have enormous infrastructure and, and have a value prop, but there's enormous amounts of disruption. I think the question alludes to a marketing message, and I think it's actually gonna be more of a utility message. When you start layering, you know, it's funny, Bitcoin has been not a top of mind in the startup world recently, but blockchain mentality and just the innovation around financing and the financial sector is gonna be pretty aggressive. Um, I think that, uh, I actually think a lot of uh, banks' messages are not necessarily just about safety. Um, I think it's about in, you know creating indulgence and empowering you to do the things that you want to do. I th- I've watched a lot of the banking messaging as we start planning on getting into a couple of clients in that sector. Um, I, I think what's way more important is that ba- that banks' brands in our society are very poor because of what happened with the Wall Street meltdowns and things of that nature. And I think a lot of Banks have been very slow to really properly transition to mobile. Um, And so there's a lot of white space and a lot of innovation coming um, that, it's funny, I can see the sharks circling around the banking sector and uh, and SF and it'll be interesting for the next decade. Keep it going. Alex asks, what do you want to be remembered for the most? Go ahead, PK. Um, Helping people be the best they can be family and otherwise. That's awesome. Um, for me, it's, uh, there's a lot of different things I think about, but one of the things that I, I really want, I talk a lot about guilting everybody I ever meet to coming to my funeral. Um, I'm very passionate about bringing more value to people than they brought to me. One of the things I admire so much about my father-in-law, Peter, is it's scary to me how many, sim- we're different, clearly in certain ways, but boy, do we have a lot of similarities. And when I started to get to know him, it was interesting to me how it, his wife, Anne, who's amazing, would talk about him and I was like, hmm, that's, like, that's, that's me, that, that's what I like. I like that everybody comes to me for help and I help them and all those things. And so that's what I would say, 5149, that I gave more to them in our relationship than they gave to me. Uh, that said, if you agree with me, I think I better re- rethink my position. Okay. Groucho Marx, 1938, duck suit. Next question. Peter, good news. This audience doesn't even know my 1990. You don't even know Groucho Marx? Do you know know, know Groucho Marx? Okay, good. Stefan, tell the truth. No. D Rock, no. Peter, Peter, they didn't even know who Samantha Fox was. Oh, that's different. Do you know who Samantha Fox is? Yeah, I I know. These are generational things. You can't compare Samantha Fox and Groucho Marx. Yes, Groucho Marx is much more classic. I agree with that. India. If you don't know who Groucho Marx is, Google him, look him up. Google him, let's go. Last one from Stefan. Stefan, oh. (laughs) Stefan asks, Gary, you talk about hustle a lot, but what cost did you have to pay to get here now? Peter, you worked really hard. Um, that's a great, I would say, at the end of the day, there doesn't have to be a cost. And I really believe that. Hmm. Um, <laughs> Got everyone's attention. Uh, you're talking to a guy who kind of spent a career at uh, maybe averaging number of hours, say almost six and a quarter to six and a half days a week, uh, 12, 14 hours average days over an entire career. Now, having said that. You're giving a lot of insight to why Lizzie is able to deal with my insanity here. So beyond multitasking and learning how to do all this stuff, when, again, you take a deep breath, along the way and you step back on the things that make a difference and the things that count that you want to focus on and to me family first um, so I always planned I was traveling a lot half my career was in the consulting business and I traveled a lot but I always tried to do day trips get back in time for a, for a late dinner whatever be there when the kids took baths uh, managed uh, little league teams from my son's how, uh, how was Alex time. Klein as a Little League baseball player? He was uh, all defense. <laughs> a little offense, but uh, not that Yes, but, on uh, the record, Alex, he eat it. He held his own and he was a starter. Okay, um, But all you defense. find time. You make time and you try to balance it out. And so I don't know if there were any real trade-offs uh, on a day-in and day-out basis. Um, doesn't have to be. If you let what yeah. you're focused on solely run your life, 
there will be uh, usually people, family, uh, uh, relationship trade-offs. I, uh, I fully believe in that. I think the practical level is that probably you and I got to spend a little less time. What we gave up was our passion for business or our careers probably came at the expense of some other potential you know, hobbies and other leisures that it didn't come at the expense of the family but you maybe never developed your golf game or your tennis game or your fishing or other things that could have been interesting to you in your life that's because, right? I would say that's, I, that's what I can feel. I mean, I've got the Jets so I've got something, a, a thing for me mm-hmm. but I definitely aren't, I would be very interested in all these other little things but I punt them for the business. Great point. Uh, may or may not be necessarily relevant, I think, because when you, again, you step back and in business, we make the point in the book, which is, by the way, think to win. <laughs> this is the, the best. Strategic thinking. <laughs> link, link, link that up, boys. Let's make up. sure we link that up. Amazon, uh, 23 <laughs> testimonials from CEOs <laughs> and others. This is um, awesome. <laughs> uh, but that said, life, personal, business, relationships is about making choices. 100%. And so there's always choices to be made. And if you get your top two or three priorities right, the order of magnitude of the next level of those kind of choices maybe you know, are not as relevant. That's right. If you try to be too much, That's too right. many, then um, you run into a storm. Let me, let me close this with yeah. something that I think will connect with the audience because it's a truth and, it, it, and it's uh, something I admire tremendously. I know this dude very well. This man's retired from the day you retired I have fundament, you know, I visit him in, in, in Florida and different things of that nature. His retirement hustle is substantially stronger than a lot of people that I know's work ethic in their normal environment. I look at you and I get pumped because I'm like, cool, if Peter can retire like that, which means, oh, I don't know, working all the time, maybe I can retire like that. So I appreciate I the air cover. I just meaning, wouldn't count on it. Meaning you think I'll lose my passion? I don't think you have the, the, uh, the, you've developed the kind of relationships and networking I have. <laughs> Please. Is that you really believe it? All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to, uh, to uh, ask a question of the day. If you want to ask this audience, entrepreneurs, young millennials, all ages and shapes and sizes, but obviously skewing a little bit younger than you, uh, what kind of question would you like to ask them to answer in the comments? Because I know you love reading it. Peter reads all your comments. He always wants to jump in. He like razzes me. He's like, you know, Sally said you stink. So like he, he, he's paying attention, boys and girls. Uh, one thing I learned over my entire career in academia as well as in business, especially relative to startup businesses, uh, one to three year old businesses, working on big brands at big companies, etc., was at the end of the day, it came down to two or three words that I would always ask when anyone brought in an idea for a new ad campaign, a new product, a new consumer promotion idea, a new opportunity within a company, small, medium, or large. It came down to two or three words. And if they could answer the question to these two or three words that went together, by the way, and I'll tell you right now, the middle word was and, so you only need two more. What would be your two words that you think every successful business needs to be able to address? Blank and blank. I like it. Yeah. We'll see what and you have to say. The answer is not blank. Got it. Peter, I love you. Cheers. Give me a kiss. Good. You can ask some questions. We'll keep answering them.